Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, journalist and author Vincent Bevins on lessons from the decade of mass protests. This image, I think, really defines much of the rest of the decade because the image of the, of the people in the square is incredibly inspiring. It is undeniably inspiring. It's hard not to be moved even when you know how it all ends. The way that social media makes these uprisings more possible also in many ways makes them weaker. As I said, you know, that Charles Tilly, not quote exactly, but that, that characterization that people reach for what is familiar, even if something unfamiliar might work better, there was often reaching for something that was like a powerful image rather than something that was really well tailored to local conditions. Vincent Bevins, welcome to Chatter. Thank you for having me. You have tackled a question that has been on my mind for a while, and I did not know that somebody who had been on the ground during some of these events was actually looking at it until recently when I saw some of your writings on it. And that's the question of why the mass protest decade, as you call it, although it's kind of a, a wide decade, why this historical number and size of mass protests have not really worked out in most cases. Right. And there are a number of great case studies in it that in some cases you've been on the ground and uh, a part of in one way or another. So, so thanks for coming on to talk about it because this is something that deserves a deeper explanation than just a shrug of the shoulders, which is what I think a lot of traditional media give it when a uh, protest ends. Right. So let's start. How, how did you come to this and become a journalist who, who found yourself in areas where, you know, you looked out your window and saw mass, mass movements going on the street and in some cases, actual physical altercations going on? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for that uh, introduction. Like certainly a lot of people have been looking at this, this question um, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, but um, in different, different national contexts in different parts of the world. And so what I tried to do, I guess, is, and then, you know, perform a, a, a task, which is necessarily very difficult, you know, nearly impossible to try to put it all together and create a global story out of it. Um, but my own interest in this, my own preoccupation with this question of what happens when a mass protest erupts and gets really, really big goes back 10 years to when I was working as a foreign correspondent in Brazil. I was living in downtown Sao Paulo in the center of uh, the largest city in South America. And a set of demonstrations began early in June, um, originally organized by a group of leftists and anarchists against a rise in the price of the bus fare. And this was a moment in Brazilian history, which was very, very different than the conditions that we would have been familiar with in, say, Egypt or Tunisia at the, at the, at the start of the so-called Arab Spring. There was a popular democratically elected president, the first woman president in office. But yet, strangely, um, and for reasons which make sense if you go back and tell the story chronologically, um, this small set of protests became a very, very big set of protests. As they became bigger and bigger, they, the meaning of the protests changed. New people came into the streets with different ideas as to what was happening. Um, these new arrivals came, entered into verbal and then ultimately violent conflict with some of the original arrivals. Um, actually, you know, within the course of a week, not only changing the meaning of what was happening, but throwing out some of the original protesters. And then if you if you look, you know, if you watch up Brazilian history unravel over the next few years, as I, you know, which I don't really watched, I lived through it. Um, a lot of the movements that were born in this strange explosion in June 2013 succeeded in pushing the country to the right, uh, to the far right, ultimately. And so this was a really strange, confounding, difficult you know, both both sort of analytically and you know intellectually and psychologically difficult question. How was yeah. it possible that these kids who were idealistic and, and left wing and just wanted better public services for the country created this explosion in this this moment of initial and apparent success, this euphoric mm -hmm. moment of oh my god, it's all happening, but then it it turned out to lead the country in the exact opposite direction. So what right. I tried to do is is is. Like many other people that lived through this, I, I paid attention throughout the rest of the decade as to what was happening. And I looked back at the things like the so-called Arab Spring, which I think shaped the interpretation of what happened in Brazil. 
And I thought the way to tackle this question is to to create a, a global history, to really put the events in chronological order and watch what happened in each place um, as events unfolded. It's it's fascinating. Your your book on this, If We Burn, brings together these these themes across protests so that each one obviously has its individual details and the local cause is always different that sparks these. But there are some 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 common breaking points, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. or hinge points and conflicts in how to escalate the, the protest into meaningful change. And you pointed out the Arab Spring. I think that one ha- has been analyzed and perhaps overanalyzed and overprojected onto others. But there are many of these that, frankly, I had forgotten even happened. Some of the right. protests in places like Greece and Spain right. uh, that are both temporally distant, but also distant because the effects uh, weren't as as dramatic, perhaps, as the Arab Spring or Brazil or South Korea and the others. So let's stay on Brazil first. You pointed out that the original spark was bus fare, which right. doesn't make sense to a lot of people in the American context. But can you explain why in Brazil the issue of what what seems like a relatively small change they were seeking in bus fare could be such an emotional and powerful rallying event. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's three things going on. And this is such a strange, as I said, such a strange and confounding moment. There's always like multiple causality at work, as there is in so many of these cases. So on the one hand, there's going to be three hands, so the metaphor is going to fall apart. But on the, on the one hand, um, Brazilians spend quite a lot of their income on transportation. So working class Brazilians really, um, if you if you look at it, end up spending up to like a third sometimes of a wage on getting back and forth to work from a very poor um, and beaten down uh, um, outskirts of the city, uh, or the, what we would call the periphery in Sao Paulo, or like a favela in the, in the Rio context. Um, so it matters. This is this, you know, people care about this. Um, but then on the other hand, the mayor of Sao Paulo, who took over in the beginning of 2013, had campaigned saying, I'm going to raise the price of the bus fare. Mm. Um, this was something that was expected. It was within inflation. Um, it was something that he believed was necessary. He didn't love doing it. He's, a, you know, he, he's somebody that himself came from the dissident left. Um, but it was it was it was it was not like you know the case of, of Ukraine where we, a lot of people thought that Yanukovych was going to sign an association agreement with the EU and then he, he he flipped. It was this was something that was going to happen. Um, but then on uh, the third hand, uh, as this begins to fall apart, is that there was a group that had identified back to two thousand three that this was a particularly explosive issue for Brazilians. That there was there was a a big uprising that started in in Salvador. Uh, in uh, yeah, in 2003, as I said, and this group watched the ways in which that had worked, and studied very, very carefully the ways that a set of rockists, rockist protests that ultimately sort of led to a uh, a general insurrection, apparently, did work to keep down the price of bus fare. And because they were so attracted as a particular type of anarchist and and leftist to the idea of like popular revolt and direct action as a driver of social change, they built a group around this. And so from 2005 to 2013, they had been studying very, very carefully how you can use a bus fare rise to set off a spark that will cause a general insurrection. Um, And they were very good at it. They knew their stuff. They knew transportation policy. They were dedicated organizers. And they really did come up with a great plan for getting people to explode into the streets um, in response to this bus fare rise. And I spent a lot of the last few years, you know, I spent the last four years doing something like 250 interviews in 12 countries, but I interviewed a lot of this group um, specifically. And they will, a lot of them will now say, oh yeah, we were absolutely right. We got everything right as to how to cause the the insurrection, how to, yeah. how to light the spark that would create the explosion. But we thought that the explosion would be good for us. We thought that the people, you know, in quotes, the people um, surging into the streets behind our demand uh, would be necessarily good. And we could sign it, we could sort of step off the scene at that point. We wouldn't have to lead anything that would just be good. It turned out not, not to be good at all for them mm. and for other people on the left. And that was sort of that is sort of one of the big mysteries of the book is that why was it believed that if you 
if you did fill the streets with millions of people or mm-hmm. the people, and I think one thing that becomes clear throughout the book is there is a distinction between the people that come and like this idea of the people, because it's always a concrete configuration of individuals. And there's also a different difference between people coming out to the streets behind your demand and them coming out to the streets after your demand, because they don't necessarily actually agree with what you've done. They just come with their own set of set of opinions. So that's how it's that's how it started. Mm -hmm. And then the the mystery, as I said, that drives a lot of the book is, well, not only why didn't the why doesn't the explosion of people onto the streets? Why why doesn't the huge scaling up in the quantitative sense of a protest that is often desired go the way that the original organizers wanted? And then sort of more profoundly, why did we think in the first place that it would? Why do we think in the first place that if you just got enough people on the streets, that would necessarily mean progress from the point of view of the people that started it? What were your initial thoughts on that? Because I just go back to Obviously, we have a selection bias when we think about this. Is right. We think about protests that led to significant change because those are the ones that made history. So you yeah. think, well, um, the French Revolution, you know, people turn out, they show up, there's a change of government. And you forget about the 100 French revolutions that didn't happen. Right. <laughs> so right. why is it that we think that it's all about people power, that if enough people are on the streets that it is at least likely to, if not almost certain to, effect change? Yeah, that's a really good question with two elements in it. Um, on the one hand, the normal story of, of mass protests that quote unquote fail or don't achieve what they want up until the 2010s was that a whole lot of people would protest and the government or whoever would be like, oh yeah, great. It's good to hear from you. I know that you think that, but I'm still going to do what I want to do. The, the, right, the protests right. in Iraq in 2003 are a good example of that. I participated. You know, we made, we, and, and this is something that becomes clear in the book is that protests, I think, are always fundamentally communicative actions. And in 2003, it was communicated that a lot of people didn't want this war to happen. And then George Bush got the message and decided to do it anyways. What's strange about the 2010s is the initial success. Um, and I think what is different to the the classic revolutions, the ones that people usually think about, you mentioned the French, um, is exactly, I think I'm trying to use your words now, the idea that it was all about people power. Because in those classic revolutions, you did have masses of people surging to the street that helped to destabilize or overthrow existing regimes. But you also had people that believed that it was their right and believed in seizing power and mm-hmm. creating a new state. Sure. So, um, and 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 we can you you know you can like or not what they did once they created the new state. You can like or not the way the, the French Revolution proceeded. You can like or not the Bolshevik, uh, 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 the government that is formed by the Bolsheviks, and and what happens after the Russian Civil War. But I think that this idea that it is all about people power. Again, it's multiple causality. There's, I think, there's there's a narrative that we have, especially in the West, especially in the in, in the rich Western world, especially in the media that I often worked for, about the end of the Soviet Union and the the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that narrative, which is not exactly correct, but certainly the elements are there, is that people stormed into the streets, the regime fell, and then something new came. You know, often there's there's problems with that narrative, but I think that a lot of what happened in the 2010s wasn't interpreted by the media, and the media really matters. We can get into that more, but there is also a ideological element, which I think sort of combines with media interpretation, combines with the possibilities offered by social media in the 2010s that says, no, no, really, it is all you need is people power. You don't. It's okay if you don't have. It's actually if there's no one that is willing to speak for the movement. There's no one willing to step into the vacuum. There's no one willing to form a new government. That's not a weakness. It's actually good. That means that we're not authoritarian. It means that we're not going to repeat the mistakes of something like the Soviet Union. It means that we're fully hyper-democratic. Hmm. Uh, there's no there's no hierarchy here. Uh, there's no ideological imposition on anybody. You can believe what you want. And as, a, as, as understandable as that ideological instinct is, and as effective as it is, at getting people into the streets, um, when it when that effectiveness actually dislodges governments or creates um, real opportunities, just people power itself has a hard time articulating the next step. Is, is often what happens. That really strikes me as important. That 
there's a couple of different issues you raised there that I think intersect here. One is that, you know, verticalism versus horizontalism, the, you know, is it a leaderless movement or as close as possible to huh. that? Um, and if so, then what happens when decisions need to be made quickly or when somebody needs to actually marshal the wider powers that are there, um, mm -hmm. maybe weren't there for the original cause, but have come out on the streets as part of the mass protest. Right. But it also intersects with this, the issue of, well, what do you judge as success? Right. Is it a proximate success like uh, the government agreeing not to raise bus fare? Right. Um, or is it the ideas and ideology behind that such that you get what you want? It kind of brings back to me that old movie, The Candidate with Robert Redford, where he wins the election and then at the end says, what do we do now? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's kind yeah. of how the Brazil case felt felt to me with the the bus fare issue. Okay, maybe you get a win on that and that seems like a cause, but then what do you do when you've got millions of people who are out there that don't have control, especially when you have a horizontalism inclined original movement, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so this is something that you see and again, I think what I've tried to do is create this global story that I think is is like a fascinating story and it works best when you go through the events in chronological order because when you do this be, rather than just you know looking back from you know the present and, and saying this was that this was that this was that you end up um erasing a lot of the complexity that in the evolution of each movement sure um and you see some things that pop up as similar and some things that are very, very different, but that were um, erased in the drive to create a, a simple narrative. But one of the things that is both a similarity across countries and al also something that only really is clear if you look at these, these movements historically is that often the original thing, they did get it. Like the, the original thing was so small that they got it quickly. But by the time they got it, there was so much energy in the streets that there was a real possibility of scaling up the ambitions of what was being asked for. But again, there's a very hard, there's a, people have a very hard time choosing what that is or articulating what the, what the elevated requests are yeah. because they, they basically in many cases were just like millions of individuals that responded to an invitation either on Facebook or that they, or, or, or news in the mainstream media, mm -hmm. unlike a lot of the, the people that pioneered protests, um, a lot of the civil rights organizations in the United States in the 50s and 60s, who would have known each other very, very well and had very, very, you know, carefully hammered out ideas as to what should be done and how it should be done. When there is this new set of possibilities as to what we can ask for, like, oh my God, I think we're pretty close to overthrowing, like, so in Gezi Park, they get the park, like in Gezi Park in Turkey, 2013, mm -hmm. they get the park. But it, it's, it becomes so, about so much more. But the question about is is what? In Hong Kong, they get the extradition bill removed. I mean, Carrie Lam, I think even like uh, even like the Communist Party of China would agree that she did a bad job in communicating that she was backing down. But they got the extradition bill removed. But by the, by, by the time that that happened, it was so much bigger and about so much more. Yeah. And in Brazil, they did get the uh, bus fare dropped. I mean, like it was annoying to the, the, the mayor of Sao Paulo. He has to find money somewhere else. He kind of believes that it's a strange, it was a strange thing to, for the people to be riding over, but he gives it in. But then you have this, this moment, as you say, and, um, to explain the strangeness of this moment, I'll, maybe I'll try to contrast two, two of the biggest cases or the cases that I find the most interesting or well, Brazil, I find interesting because I lived through it, but mm -hmm. the Brazilians were really horizontal list. Um, the original, the original group really believed in a movement that did not have any hierarchy or leaders. They did not believe that they should be in a position of leadership relative to society. There certainly should be no spokespersons or persons that represent the group to the media. Um, everyone is really equal in their group. Everyone is so equal that they actually insist on full consensus and decision making, which means that even to take a vote and say, okay, most of us want to do this, but we're, and, but we're all going to do it. That even that would be sort of seen as a sort of in, authoritarian imposition of will onto the people that didn't vote for it. Hmm. And when this, when they get w the the uprising that they thought that they always wanted, and it starts to go in directions that they never could have imagined, it starts to become more right wing. There is this, as I say, there is this question of well, what is it now if it's not just these twenty cents 
rise in bus fare. And all of all of the mainstream media, which are a lot more powerful and have a lot more um, um, discursive heft behind them than the original organization does. And as people in the streets start to combat, like fight the left, they the horizontal their horizontalist ideals come up against two very important barriers very quickly. One is that they've spent eight years trying to cause a popular uprising. They ne- and as I, you know, one of the characters in the book, Lucas uh, Vegetable Montero, a lot of them come from the punk scene. Um, he says, we had no plan for the day afterwards because we kind of thought we didn't have to. But when, when it became clear that there were opportunities, we had a very h- hard time coming up with a new point of the group, a new tactic, or right. even a new strategic positioning. It's virtually impossible to think there'd be consensus on that, right? Because exactly. even if there was this universal feeling of the bus fare, what do you do then when you now have 10, 100 times the number of people involved? You're you're going to violate your principle on horizontalism, or you're going to pick by some means, maybe it is a vote, maybe it is just by who speaks the loudest, you're going to pick the next goal, but it's going to divide the group necessarily. Right, exactly. And this, you know, the principle of horizontalism, and this is quite paradoxical, a- appears to be violated by or threatens to be violated by thousands of Brazilians trying to join the group. Thousands of Brazilians saying, we saw what you've done. I mean, we saw it on TV. Um we saw a sort of mediated version of what it is you were doing, but this seems great. You guys are doing, you guys are taking risks and, and going out and taking action to make things cheaper for Brazilians. But the original group doesn't know how to integrate all these people because the original group is so tight that if you let in a thousand people, then what is the group? It's just whatever these people think it is. And often what they think it is, is not really what it is because they just heard about it from television. After, you know, after the mainstream media starts to be in favor of these protests rather than against them, they have a very different idea of what it is. But then if they try to create like a two tier system, we're like, okay, well, there's like a training course. Well, then that's, that's, that's hierarchy. That's the end of horizontalism. So, so what they do is they just kind of go away. Uh, They decide to retreat from the scene and, 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 this means that meaning there is a fight over what the thing means. And in the case of Brazil, it is well, well positioned, well financed, often financed. I mean, again, there's not that many of these kids, just like on, there weren't that many on the left. But kids that were getting money from uh, think tanks or the Atlas Institute uh, based in D.C., one of whom who had trained under the Koch brothers in the United States, they sort of knew how to put together a right-leaning protest movement, and they and they just copied the name of the first group <laughs> and put together a, a movement which played a, a very big role in, in pushing for the impeachment of the president ultimately three mm-hmm. years later and then for electing Jair Bolsonaro. But right. then in, in Egypt, which is another case, I think, what did, how did you say it? Uh, you were pointing towards the same uh, metaphor that I like here, which is that, like, the dog catches the car, right? right. Like, you, yeah. Like, yeah. like, oh, my God, this is actually really happening. Mm-hmm. We 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 always wanted it to, but we hadn't really, we didn't really think it was. The a lot of the organizers of what became the Egyptian Revolution in 2011 um, would have loved to have more structured, hierarchically organized, even parties or unions or revolutionary organizations or civil society groups um, in January 2011. They just didn't, and the reason they didn't was not so much. Um, that they were anarchists, but that all of these groups had been decimated under decades of the Mubarak government. And, you know. Mm-hmm. the police are ripping off their uniforms throwing them in like throwing them in you know hiding them behind in an alleyway and running away 
which is what in most of these protests over history, that's what you want. You Right, exactly. Want, that's exactly what <laughs> want the security forces, however defined, to right. join the cause and right. work with you. Right. You want them to either give up or join or to, to join with you. They just and so, had to talk through what they were going to do with that. And so what they do is they, t- they, they rely on, and this is something that emerges in the, this is something that sociologists of contention have understood for a long time. Charles Tilley is one of the most important thinkers in this tradition. Yep. He says that in, in moments of response to injustice, in moments of, of what he calls contention, People reach for something that is familiar, even if something that we're unfamiliar might be more effective. So a lot of Egyptians tell me now, oh, if we could do it again, which like, you know, you can't really. That's the point. You can only really surprise a regime with an accidentally huge uh, explosion uh, every once in a while. But they say if we could do it again, when the police ran away, we would have tried to take over some of the actual centers of power in Cairo. At the very least, taken over like the television stations and sort of broadcast what we were doing, but they, number one, had never thought of that. And number two, if they had to make the decision as to what to broadcast, it wouldn't have been clear. There were so many different ideological, um, there was no Martin Luther King or core or, Mm. you know, there was no national assembly. Right. Um, and so what they do is they, they stay in the square. And then this image, I think really defines much of the rest of the decade because the image of the, of the people in the square Mm. is incredibly inspiring. It right. is undeniably inspiring. It's like it's hard not to be moved, even when you know how it all ends. I feel like it's it's a powerful image, you know. And and there are there are several images that are seared in my memory from you know standing up to authority in my living memory, and that's right. one. I'm old enough to remember Tiananmen Square and and to see you know standing in front of a tank. Um, there are certain things that the word that comes to my mind is powerful, mm-hmm. and yet you just pointed out it was. It was exactly the opposite. That is, they didn't go for the instruments of power. They didn't go even for the TV stations and the radio stations like a lot of coups have learned. They didn't go for government offices. They didn't go for power. They went for the image. Now, maybe it wasn't a conscious thing, if you can put it into the minds of the individuals who were in some sense leading, but it, it sticks with us in our memory, but it didn't lead to the the long term change that most of the people there wanted, yeah. And so, like you said earlier, uh, in, in, your, your original wording, the idea that people power that that it was all about people power. I think that even if they had been as as you know as as bloody minded and revolutionary and, and hard headed as as other revolution revolutionary movements had been in the past, you still want the powerful image. You still want the communicative part of the revolution. You still mm-hmm. want to show to the world. That you know, people of all all walks of life, uh, uh, secular and Islamist, uh, young and old, rich and poor, are coming together in support of this thing. But the I, the idea was that, that that was all you needed. Like, right? You would still want, just like you had in the French Revolution, the Russian Re- Revolution, the the masses of relatively unorganized. I mean, everyone's organized in some way or another, but the masses of the people that are not sort of some part of some uh, intentional revolutionary group. You still need that, but it was it, it just stopped right there, and so they did get, they did get the security forces to defect. The Egyptian military ends up refusing to to uh, 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 carry out Mubarak's orders, which means that's the end. Of, that's the end of the government. That's how you know you're done if the military doesn't think that's you're the president. You're not the president. Not the president. Yeah, <laughs> and but then but they but they did so in a position where the revolution, quote unquote, whatever that was, whoever the square is was in a very, very weak position to influence what the new military government did. The new military government did call elections, which was not clear, but they did. But whenever they they they, they committed abuses, whenever they, they deviated from what the people in the square would have liked them to do, there was very, very little way that you could mm-hmm. influence them, except for trying to do the square thing again. And this is, a you know, like many things in the book, it's very understandable, but ultimately tragic, is that it becomes clear that you can't really do talk for your square yeah. every time you have a minor complaint like that requires somebody to be like in the back like at the negotiating table with the government saying this is the force that i have behind me right. if you don't do it we're gonna you know we're gonna you know we're gonna shut down the economy or we're gonna withdraw votes you know all the ways that we have to to make um to make the, that movements have uh, to make their power known um and they didn't um and so and that wasn't because they were horizontalist it was because some kind of horizontality 
was dictated by the decimation of, of, of much of North African society. Yeah. That seemed similar to me in some ways to Turkey, where it was the idea of you can't keep going back to the same well and doing the same thing. So right. you occupy the park and it gets a lot of attention. Um, and then you, you, you try to do the same kind of thing again and it's just literally bulldozed over, right? It's, it's, yeah. it, it, you need, you need change, but it's really hard to change something that just worked so well or right. seemed to work so well. And it was so powerful. And I get, and we, we live in, in a really mediated society and I, this is a big focus of the book because I'm, because I'm a media actor in the narrative, I can critique the ways that my class, I think made big mistakes. But because we are such a mediated society, you get that the power of the top of your image mm -hmm. repeated elsewhere in the world and elsewhere in the decade, where national conditions are very, very different. Um, and you get that you get it repeated even after things have gone really badly in Egypt, even yeah. after it's, yeah. it becomes clear that this particular method did not work where it started. So, you know, Occupy Wall Street is very famously a copy of Tahrir Square. Uh, it's Adbusters magazine that has this idea to bring Tahrir Square to the United States. By 2014, which is after the coup that brings Sisi to power in Egypt, um, you have Occupy Central in Hong Kong. So this is a copy of Occupy Wall Street, which was a copy of Tahrir Square, which was inspired by Tunisia. Yeah. Not only is it like really far from where the decisions are actually being made, which is Beijing. So it's like, it's hard to understand how this is going to put direct pressure on the yeah. people that are making the decisions. It's a, this tactic is chosen after it didn't even work in Egypt. But I want to go back to, to what you said about Turkey because it's really interesting. Yeah. Because as the decade goes on, and this is something that was part of like this techno utopian illusion that we had at the beginning of the decade that like only pr progressive forces knew how to use the internet, like 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 presidents and dictators and 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 military military leaders weren't going to also figure out how these things work and learn from what happens elsewhere. Because as, as the decade goes on, it becomes clear that you can do one of three things, basically, with these explosions. You can crush them because you don't like what it might do. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have the military on your side, you can get away with it. You can crush them. Or friendly nearby militaries like Bahrain with right. uh, Saudi across the coast. Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia just 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 drives over the bridge and crushes Bahrain. Uh, Syria, this is a classic example. You know, after what happens in in Libya, um, a lot of leaders that have the support of the security services decide that you can just crush the thing. Or what you can do is you can try to give the people what they want, and this is a strange, again, this kind of bizarre conundrum that. Uh, People find themselves in both Turkey and Brazil in, in 2013 because President President Dilma Rousseff wants to give the people something. They've already got the 20 cent fare rise. There's this huge up, you know, the, the people are on the streets. This is what she believes in. She, yeah, you know, right. she fought the dictatorship. She was tortured as a dissident. Yep. But They're preaching to the, the choir, right? Yeah, yeah. They all want the same thing, kind of. But nobody knows, nobody knows, not the original organizers and not Dilma Rousseff, the president know what to do with this ball of energy because the ball of energy is not and cannot elaborate a set of concrete demands that after they are conceded Dilma can credibly believe everyone will go back to the streets like it'll, the, the, the streets will never be able to, 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 to speak in that kind of a voice and say we want these three things and if you give it to us then we'll go home when everyone wins be and then this also happens in Gezi Park because the, the Gezi Park protesters just like the Egyptians they knew that they didn't want the, they don't care, you know, the, it was a nice park. It's, it's right in the middle of, I don't know if you know, Istanbul, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit of green, that bit of uh, uh, central Istanbul. They didn't want it to, to be destroyed, but it wasn't a huge deal for them. And they assumed it was going to be destroyed. They didn't think this was going to be a big issue for the people of Istanbul. Um, but they get so many people in the square that it's clear that they can kind of ask for something. And these are quite influential people too. This is the middle class in Istanbul. But the government doesn't really know. They try to create some kind of a negotiation process, but the negotiation process falls apart. And eventually, Erdogan just opts for the first response, which is, all right, well, I'm just going to clear you out and deal with the consequence. I don't know what I'm supposed to, you know, just I'll clear you out. And then there's the third, third way you can respond, which it turns out is quite effective. You just kind of wait. Mm -hmm. um, 
This yeah. is what this is what Beijing does in Hong Kong. They try as much as possible, and it, like we don't know, you know, be, this is the way that Beijing operates. That we don't, we're not going to have access to their their thinking. But if it were the case that they decided, let's make sure that we don't give them martyrs. Let's let's not give the the movement like the death or the the horrible images of police repression that would cause it to to, to spiral even further out of control. And then let's just let them get tired of doing that. That that seems to have been that story, which is by nature, by its by its very nature, speculation mm-hmm. would align more or less with what happened. And you know, if yeah. you just wait, eventually people that have to go back to work have to go back to work. It requires a couple of things, though. Number one, it requires the leadership to have strategic patience with uh, <laughs> right. With- History not on your side there because so many governments are so bad at that. But right. also it requires that the protest is one that is ironically large enough that it can't be sustained for a long period of time because you're probably not going to have the majority of the population who are either unemployed or students or others who are willing to spend the majority of their time on the street or rotating occupation of certain territory. Instead, for it to be that true mass movement, you, you've you got to get out the, in many cases, the middle class. You've got to get people out there who almost by definition can't sustain it on yep. a daily basis for months or years. Yeah. If you, need, if you want people power, you need people with jobs. Yeah. You can't just have de- dedicated leftists and like sort of dedicated right. activists and grad students the uh, and, you know, uh, people like living in the, like you do get all of those things in, in the, like people like, like living in central Cairo, like kids that live on the street or live in Santiago, mm-hmm. but you need people that have to go back to work eventually. And this is something that, and again, seems, turns out to be a problem with horizontalism, because if you're requiring people to show up, everyone to show up to the meeting, the endless assembly where everybody gets to vote, uh, this Brazilian philosopher, Rodrigo Nunes, he calls this the fetishism of presence, which is like mm-hmm. whoever can get there. Mm-hmm. But there's a particular type of person that can get there all the time. That's and right. in you do need these moments where, oh my God, we've gotten a lot of normal people, a people that would, of course, would never be part of some kind of a revolutionary organization, not even like a kind of a, you know, membership in sort of one of the, the more um, broad-based civil rights movements of the U.S. in the 50s and 60s. But the fact that they're out here really, really shows you something. But at that moment, that's when you need to, if you're trying to get concessions, then you need to present to the to state, this is what we want. You know, and like in a union organization, you can ask for a bunch of stuff you're not going to get. You can ask for really radical stuff that will, you know, get people, you know, raise awareness about the issues and get people talking about particular possibilities for a, a, a better future. But then you also want to like behind the scenes tell the government like, well, you know what, if you give us A, B and C, we will tell everyone to go home and they probably will. And we can all kind of go home acting like we won. Because if you don't give, if, there, if that exit ramp doesn't exist for the state, then the other alternative is to actually overthrow the state and make a new one. Um, and this is something that would a lot of people would have liked to do in more, you know, um, in, in more pronounced cases like in Egypt. But it turned out that it was easier to overthrow, to get Mubarak to run away than it was to create a revolutionary government. Yeah. Well, there's something you said a moment ago that I want to come back to. You pointed out how, you know, Tahrir Square essentially inspired or was was borrowed from by Occupy Wall Street, which in turn did the same thing for Hong Kong, which in turn, in a relatively short period of time, uh, this is something that didn't happen so much hundreds of years ago. You you did have movements in certain periods of time where they, they borrowed from each other, but usually it wasn't instant just because of the nature right. of communication and transportation. What do you think the role of social media has been in this, for example, you know, people in Turkey seeing what's happening in Brazil or vice versa, and right. if not learning from each other, at least being aware enough that it's discussed uh, about next steps. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting that question because it's it it points to two different phenomena. One is that in the history of revolutions, they do come in waves. Um, they do there tends to be some kind of contagion. You can look to, at moments in, in history where there are clusters of uprising, clusters of revolutions around a certain year. So like you have the Spring of Nations in 1848, which is partially one of the you know inspirations for the, the name Arab Spring, which is you know tellingly imposed from the outside by an American. Um, 
but that process was slower and it would and it wouldn't it wouldn't allow for the automatic adoption of a tactic that was that was um developed somewhere else so you you did have like newspapers being taken across Europe in 1848 you did have people finding out about the french revolution absolutely but media and then social media i think allow for a real acceleration of this process um it allows for people around the world to see what is happening like almost instantly somewhere else and and part of this is quite effective if you are an organizer part of this is really powerful because it allows for the the transference or it allows for global solidarity it allows for people to become very very inspired by other people and to get in contact and say i've seen you you know this look at what they can do if they can do this we can do this but it also allowed for this weird kind of copying and pasting i think uh, of tactics that happened uh, in the 2010s where, as I said, you know, that Charles Tilly, not quote exactly, but that that characterization that people reach for what is familiar, even if something better might work, even if something unfamiliar might work better, there was often reaching for something that was, as you said a second ago, like a powerful image yeah. rather than something that was really well tailored to local conditions. Because yeah. in the case of um, you know, it matters, for example, that Cairo is the capital of Egypt. And as I said, that Hong Kong is not the capital of the People's Republic of China, that the decision makers are very far away and care about quite a lot more, you know, even if you hate them as a government, it makes a lot of sense that they have to they have to think about everyone in the entire PRC rather than just Hong Kongers. Hmm. Um, and so th- I think you have an acceleration of this transference of tactics, just like you have an acceleration of the transfer of solidarity. Um, And then even while you have some ideological support for horizontalism, um, Brazil being the most obvious case of this, because they're very, very serious about it. A lot of them would now say they they became dogmatic about it. (laughs) You also have social media allowing for the rapid scaling up of a protest that will necessarily be kind of structureless, will necessarily be kind of ad hoc, that, you know, people will come together so quickly mm-hmm. that they won't necessarily know who each other are or what other people think the protest is about. So as I say, like multiple causality is essential for almost, you know, any time, you know, the, the phenomenon that I chose to analyze is a, a protest that gets so large that it overthrows or fundamentally destabilizes a government. Yeah. That always re- means multiple causality. There's always more than one right. reason for that. Um, local, global, media, uh, affective, economic, and so on. Yeah. And I think that social media is one of those reasons. It's one of the things that gets you over the line in many cases. But I think a mistake earlier in the decade was to th- say or to tell yourself that it was about social media and a, and a really big mistake was to think that to the extent that social media was part of the, the, the recipe, that it was a positive part. I think that the, the way that social media makes these uprisings more possible also in many ways makes them weaker. And then often because of sort of deep ideological concerns or, 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 you know, or just the ways that we like to tell stories, the global media saw these weaknesses as, as strengths. Yeah. Um, but I think that you, you know, it, it, it really helps for in explaining how many, how so many people got on the streets at once. Cause like, again, Zeynep Tufekci, hope I'm pronouncing that a Turkish sociologist who was at Gezi, who's been involved in a lot of the digitally coordinated social movements back to the two thousands. She talks about the ways in which, going back to CORE and SNCC and the, the black civil rights organizations in the United States, mm-hmm. organizing those actions was really hard. It took off in years of selecting people, training people, deciding on what to do, printing flyers, organizing with local communities, all this outreach. And that necessarily meant that everybody knew each other and there was quite a cohesive movement. People had spent two years sort of in the struggle together. And and often these these organizations were absolutely unapologetic about being hierarchical and disciplined and and, and 
deciding who was allowed to do what and who wasn't and who was the right person for a job. But in, in, you know, in, in, in now it is conceivable that right after we finish this podcast, there is something so shocking on the internet that we all see it. And then we all go into the streets one hour afterwards that we, we all, that later tonight, we're all going to look at the same post and all come to the conclusion that that post is bad enough that we need to get into the streets. And then, you know, then afterwards it depends on who went into the streets and what their ideas are about what the streets are are about. Um, So social media, I think, is is a complicated part of the story, but yeah. I, I reject the idea that it's the story. Sure. Well, we've talked a, a bit about early in the decade, but I, I do want to move to later in the decade because you've pointed out that 2019 was a world record, if you will, that right. there were mass protests in almost 40 countries. And it was everywhere from Sudan to Iraq and Algeria, uh, Indonesia, all over Latin America, right. India, Lebanon, um, all kinds of places. Um, most of them did not meet even their initial goals. Um, and, and certainly none of them had the revolutionary change, even though there was learning from the mass protests earlier in the decade and the social media, in mm-hmm. a sense, a lot in their favor in terms of the ability. But then you also had the other part that you mentioned, which is governments watching previous protests and realizing which of these strategies, as you've laid out, would be most effective in the local circumstance. But what do you what do you attribute to the fact that by by almost a decade of these growing learning experiences, the advances of technology, that here we are at the end of 2019 as the pandemic is beginning, and there really isn't that much to show for it from this massive year of protest. Yeah. So, so to go back to that Tilly quote that people reach for what is familiar, even if things that are less familiar might be more effective. Yeah. Um, people also reach for what is possible and what is easiest. And as I said a little bit, uh, as I described briefly in the Egyptian context, all of the other kinds of things that you could do, all of the other kinds of ways that you could respond to injustice um, had become quite difficult because of the concrete decimation of many of the alternative power centers in right. advanced capitalist society. So it is incredibly effective to have a national union movement that says to the leader of a country, we're going to shut down all the ports for the next month unless you change this foreign policy position, for example. That's really effective. It also takes a really, really long time to put together and organized labor uh, has had been decimated in many countries you know, from the 80s until the 2010s. Um, it is effective to be in a position in, say, a parliamentary system where a left or right, whatever, you know, because in the book, I, I choose movements that are all across the ideological spectrum. A lot of them are Right. Start on the left because that's kind of the, the history of protest. But more and more people on the right realize they can do this too. Um, it's very effective to be, you know, have a veto, have veto power in National Congress. But it's also very, very hard <laughs> to get there. It's effective to boycott um, uh, either target target boycotts at a national state, uh, target boycotts at a at a country or at an industry. But that's very, very hard to put together. All of these things. Um, really take time, but it remains in 2019 incredibly easy to get a viral post to upset quite a lot of people and get things get people into the streets. Um, and again, that that is really effective at some things. It is effective at sending a message. Is it affecting? It is effective at putting pressure on people. But what we're talking about often at the core of the reasons for these various movements are desires for changes so radical that you can't just ask existing elites to do them for you. Either the existing elites are incapable of carrying out what you're asking because of their commitments to other other parties, you know, either, you know, economic elites, international partners, and so on. Or 
they are literally incapable because of the nature of the structure of 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 their of their power and so something like lots of people in the streets saying we're mad about this works for certain demands but if you for example want to reshape power structures in the middle east like so many of the north african revolutionaries did um then you actually have to go further than sending a message to people in power but just to answer more directly about 2019 what happened is the media stops paying attention because we all start paying attention to covid so uh. you get this strange um you get uh huge amounts of movements around the world um that are still born um because well eat, like the governments now have a really good excuse to send people home and it's interesting like in the chilean context like precisely the opposite to the us context where lockdowns were seen as something that like liberals in the left were, were okay with in the chilean context because the lockdowns seem to be a convenient way to end the uprising some of the left was like well maybe like this is fake maybe this is cia mm. cia <laughs> yeah. uh, this, is, this is a psyop um and or and then again this is kind of this is kind of i think the tragic sort of first as tragedy then as farce dynamic which reveals itself in so many of the cases in this decade if the most inspiring image of the entire decade was actually concretely, narrowly speaking, a bunch of people in the square asking for a military coup, which they got. Um, and in the Egyptian context, in the case of Tahrir Square, asking for the military to intervene to throw, overthrow Mubarak can be seen as more progressive than what you have before. Like there's there are times in which you want the military to help to overthrow an existing uh, government. There's an, there are times when a military coup can be progressive compared to what is the previous mm-hmm. state of things. That's how Egypt is born in the first place. Yep. But in other cases, you do ultimately kind of get a coup. And this, you know, by Bolivia 2019, a lot of people are starting to remember, ah, yes, um, when people in the streets demand the end of a system... And there must be ultimately be the imposition of order, unless you're on the very, the very anti-authoritarian mm-hmm. end of the radical left, left spectrum, where you think that somehow perhaps the insurrection can become the new, the new perfect uh, anarchy, the yeah. new perfect anarchy, which you know at least in this in the case of the 2010s did not happen. Order is going to be restored somehow. Often it's the military that restores it, and people start to remember by the end of the decade. Ah, yes, what was often forgotten because you know, for understandable reasons, U.S support for these coups was fundamental so we and 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 and, uh, you know a huge part of the story of the cold war of course a lot of my first book is about precisely this dynamic but it is also true that the u.s backed military coup in brazil in 1964 was preceded by middle class protests a lot of regular people in the streets who just like everybody else that's ever lived had legitimate complaints about their society and this was used. They some of them were calling for the coup, and then other way in other circumstances, this was used as a pretext for the coup. The 1973 U.S. backed military coup in Chile, which overthrows democratically elected socialist Salvador Allende and leads to the Pinochet dictatorship, was also preceded by mass protests. Um, and so, you get the the yeah the dog. Now, maybe taking this uh, analogy to silly, uh, in, in, in very silly uh, lengths now, but let's see how this works. The dog catches the car, scares off the driver, but doesn't know how to drive. <laughs> Does that work? I don't know. Um, wow. That's, trying it out that, the first time. That stretches it, but, it, but it, it's, it's truthy, right? <laughs> yeah, that it's truthy. truthy. It's got to close it. enough. Yeah. Now, we've, we've talked about all these cases that, you know, the, the, the flame burned out, or like you said, in some cases, the dog did catch the car, but had, had, had difficulty driving for obvious reasons. But we, we, we can point to one success, if you will, during this decade. And that's, mm-hmm. that's South Korea, right? Right. What, what went differently there? And in looking at it, do you think there is a lesson that other movements can learn? Or is it too specific to the South Korean context? Well, I think there's, I, I think the way that I come down and like, again, this is not like a book. This is not like a statistical regression. This book is not like a, 
you know, this many failed and this many succeeded. But no, it's it's, a, it's is, more of a granular on the streets study than a you know rigorous right. academic study. But there, right. but there is truth in that from, right. from right. learning from the people involved in so many countries. Right. And so yeah. So just with that with that caveat, I, I end up coming to the conclusion that there's 13 episodes. Ten of them are really about mass protest transforming um, things. Um, two are successes, and one is kind of um, a, a wash. One, it depends who you ask. The Euromaidan movement is experienced as success for some of its participants, but not right. as not right. for many of its others. Right. Um, South Korea, I think, to the extent that there was a clear demand, it's it was it was a success. So you had a president. There was a, a president whose corruption and uh, sinister and strange. I mean, it's it's, it's a fascinating story. Sinister dealings were revealed. Um, you had civil society groups, including unions, and I think in, in all, in actually in every, this is another lesson is that, as I said, even if unions have been decimated and even if it's very hard to put these kinds of things together, in every case where things worked pretty well, you had the successful application of economic pressure. Yeah. So back to Tunisia, the, you know, right. the case that was really successful, you had a right. major union throwing mm -hmm. its support behind the revolution very early. Mm -hmm. uh, and in South Korea, you had civil society groups that were like discrete and identifiable. So it wasn't just like a mass of everyone in the street for whatever reason they wanted to be there. The, the, the people in the streets were discrete and identifiable and the demand was very clear. It was the removal of the president. Um, again, they got the removal of the president not because people power magically made it happen, but it became very clear to the political class that there's a real, there's real desire for this. There's grounds for it. And they remove her. And then it also works out for them because the next president is more in line with their ideological align, ideological uh, predispositions. The new president is more center left. Um, and, you know, I put this in the book. He ends up pushing for unification in a way, which there's a very sweet, like I go to the, the winter Olympics in, in, uh, in Korea and like the, the North and South Korean, women's hockey team right is one is one that. team it's a, it's a nice it's a nice image but yeah so it i think that there is a, a small lesson but it's also they are asking for something relatively easy to get which is for the political class to remove a president that has been revealed to mm -hmm. be breaking quite a lot of laws now um so uh, uh, but it all is also something that that does matter right because as i said you can you can allow for all kinds of euphoria and dreaming and reimagination of the possibilities of life in the explosion. I think that this is something that you see throughout revolutionary history and throughout humanity, the history of humanity, that in these moments where history is being made, people discover new things about themselves and about what they want the world to be. But when the inevitable conclusion arrives, if you're not going to overthrow the government and put in a, a revolutionary committee of some kind or, or create a, a new state mm -hmm. um then then you're then you're relying on existing elites to um deliver on demands and what a lot of people that would have told me a lot of people that i spoke to over the course of four years is that extracting concessions from a government in a moment when the government is threatened by people power by you does not mean that you've betrayed a long-term <laughs> commitment to you know, going back and building even better organizations and building more people power. You can allow the government to kind of get away with what feels like a win, just like you can kind of let a, let, you know, the bosses at the factory turn the machines back on because they've, they've come up with a deal that suits them even, but, but you understand that you won because you made them do it. And then you can go back to the people and, 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 and build for the next fight. And um, is, is there real consensus on that though? Because I got the sense from a lot of the activists you spoke to that, any discussion with existing authority is is inherently corrupt, right? So even if you have somebody, you know, obviously if it's somebody in Brazil who becomes an elected representative, um, that in itself is a sellout. Um, and if it's a negotiation with the government in any way uh, outside of pure force, then that is a betrayal, again, for some activists, um, right. that you can't have a deal with an existing authority structure. Right. So this is something that existed 
as I said earlier, in the more ideologically horizontalist elements in yeah. protests across the decade, um, from Chile to Brazil. I mean, even in Egypt too, there were people in Egypt that were like, there were people in Egypt that said in 2012, I'm not going to participate in the new election because it's not about an election. It's not about tinkering with the state. It's about creating an entirely new, t- different, mm-hmm. uh, an entirely new type of society. And in the case of the Brazilian uh mpl the movimento passi livre the the punks and anarchists that started the whole thing they had decided in advance not to negotiate they knew that the government was going to try to negotiate but they didn't well number they 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 believed that that was not the best way to push for the lowering of the bus rise but they also believe in a deeper sense in a very sort of Believe is the right word. They really believe in direct action yeah. and the, the struggle on the streets. But even they wanted the government to change policy. So they, 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 wanted, they thought the government was going to change policy because of an insurrection. But that's what they wanted was the government to change policy because they wouldn't have. I mean, they, that group would have been horrified by something like the Egyptian solution because – in the Brazilian context, the military taking over for a democratically elected Dilma Rousseff would have been horrifying. And they were indeed horrified when she was ultimately removed. So there are there were people across the decade, especially at the begin, especially in 2010, mm-hmm. that did believe that negotiation with existing power structures um, is means that you're always you you lost already. You're always going to be co-opted, you're always going to be uh, turned into part of the existing power structure. Um there were people that believed that any kind of political representation was inherently suspect. There were those ideological elements across the beginning of the 2010s. Across the end of the 2010s, some people still felt that way, but a lot less. This was, this was. I mean, it's very hard to summarize the ways in which, you know, 200 to 225 people changed their mm-hmm. opinions. Mm-hmm. But people came down, if anyone that changed their opinion moved more in the direction of, oh, we should have had a revolutionary organization that was actually ready to take a new state, or we should have been willing to take a win when we had the opportunity and then build towards a revolutionary organization with long-term with long-term mm-hmm. goals. But yeah, there were moments in which I think most of the story of the quote-unquote failures of the decade is about the impossibility of putting together the right, any different type of response um, in these moments, but there were actually moments where you could have said, well, actually at this moment, you could have maybe exited with a win if there wasn't this opposition a priori to negotiation, uh, that you point to. So it was, it was something that that was there and mattered in in, in some key moments, um, at the beginning of the decade. One other big point that I want to address before we go is the fact that so many, activists you spoke to ultimately realized, and this is true, whether it's uh, activist energetic left or activist energetic right, Uh um, everybody has this teleological point of view. They think that we do this, therefore the arrow, it's, it's going in the right direction. Right, right. But I think most of them realize, uh, especially with some success, that there's no such thing as a political vacuum and right. whoever's waiting in the wings takes advantage of the, whatever you want to call it, the weakened government, the tired society, the uh, opportunity for change. Right. And it doesn't go the way they think it's going to go. Exactly. That seems to happen, not in every case, but in almost every case. And it's almost, is it political naivete about the fact that you you have blinders on about your your ideology and your mission, and you don't realize there are other political actors out there that are just waiting? I think a lot of people came to the conclusion that they were a bit naive about this um, and came to the realization that, oh yeah, there are quite a lot of other people that are trying to shape which direction we all go um, than just us or you know, the idea that history on its own, history with a capital H, is pushing us all in one direction. And I do think that this kind of teleological mode of thought was fairly widespread, especially in the English-speaking first world, especially after the end of the Cold War with the fall of the Berlin Wall. But really ironically, 
And, you know, this falls apart very quickly if you if you think about it. Uh, but ironically, people with very different ideas of where history should go all kind of thought that it was definitely going to go there. Um, there were there were people that, you know, the, 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 there was the broader sort of Fukuyama and liberal tradition that thought that everyone was going to end up like junior America in a capitalist world system that was also democratic. But you also had anarchists that kind of thought if you just gave the thing a kick, mm -hmm. if you just removed the oppressive structures that were quite actually kind of like a paper tiger or kind of like easy to knock over, then you would get sort of anti-authoritarian. Uh, or libertarian socialism. And then you got conservatives that all, that believe, no, actually, God is on our side. And I think ironically, in all cases, teleological modes of thought kind of have to do with this deep idea of God being on your side. So to use this, uh, to, to attempt another uh, uh, strained metaphor, if you, if you said that people all thought that there was just like one arrow pointing in one way, there was this idea that, oh, all of the forces of history are pushing us towards that. It's push. There's one arrow pushing towards what I see as forward. I'm looking towards progress, and all we have to do is knock this thing out of the way, knock the knock the remaining um, impediments to this arrow, mm -hmm. and it, it'll just rush through and just get there. So it's not that hard. We just have to knock that over, knock that over. That allows the arrow to whoosh forward to where it's supposed to go. But what actually what actually happens when some impediments, some structures are knocked over is you don't realize that there's one arrow. There's a war of position of like 40, 50 different groups within society that are all pushing against each other to, to, get, to get things a little bit more that way or a little bit more that way, a little bit more this way. And the people that do the best in this war of position of, you know, 50 arrows all pointing at each other. Um, um, you know, pushing the line of scrimmage, you know, a little bit to the right or to the left or, 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 you know, a little bit more authoritarian, a little bit more libertarian. The people who do, um, best in this unexpected war of all against all are the people that are prepared, organized, and, and, and have an, a coherent idea of how they're going to mobilize. So, it is, it is the people that rush into that vacuum and push as hard as they can in a certain direction. In rare cases, they actually just seize power in general. But often I think uh, advanced industrial society is so complex that you can't just kind of like grab the state like the Bolsheviks could. Like, But what you can do is really push things in a new direction or you can take over big parts of the state. And often it is the groups that are ready and prepared for... Yeah. This kind of a contest and the people like the group, the, you know, the, the, to go back to the beginning of our conversation, the people like the group in Brazil, that just believed our job is to light the spark and then step off stage, yeah. um, ended up not being a part at all of that, of that war of everyone against everyone, uh, because they just kind of thought they believed in the arrow rather than 50 arrows all pointing at each other. And that, and that can lead to the situation. I love the way you phrase this, uh, in your book. Um, if you burn down your building, divine providence does not supply you with a better one. If you chop down a tree, you do not automatically get a bigger one. Sometimes you are just left with a stump. Right. Important, important point for people uh, seeking to, to just spark something and hope that it goes well. Yeah, well, this is something that I spoke with Rodrigo Nunes, that Brazilian philosopher I, I mentioned earlier about this. And this is something that he said people in the global South tend to understand better because he said that a lot of people in places like Libya or Somalia understand what it's like when just like the state is defeated full stop. Yeah. You don't, you don't get like the, the automatic flowering of workers cooperations. You get warlords and you get, you get civil war, you get often years of violence mm -hmm. in that endless battle of all those arrows pointing at, at each other trying to trying to scramble for position and this is again i think this also has to do with the nature of advanced industrial society like in the medieval era it might have been possible to just like kill a quite evil king and then if you you know if you knew that your king was like especially psychopathic yeah. and just like yeah. really bad 
Right. Well, then it was really just a matter of killing one individual and then some other, you know, his brother was going to take over and that was, you know, odds are he was going to be better. And that is, you can sort of reconstruct the state on that basis. But uh, even then you're talking about somebody entering the power vacuum. But in in the case of just like lighting the fire, which is kind of why, you know, the book is called If We Burn, the, the, there's a lot of elements in the book that have to do with starting a fire and then and then having the flames tended to by somebody else and, and the question of what who actually tends to the flames, what actually happens. But that's part mm. of the reason why the, the book is called If We Burn. Because, with, yeah, if we burn, then what? Uh, and and that, really de- that really depends on the world that already existed before the fire is lit. It exists on the configuration of forces that exist the day before the explosion. Mm-hmm. You don't, like, open a portal into the promised land. You don't, it's not, you don't, you don't, you don't, step into a new a new universe it is it's the same people that were there yesterday that 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 figure out how things go tomorrow i appreciate that well we end all of our conversations here on chatter by reaching into our chatter box and pulling out a random pre-printed question Mm -hmm. sounds good please recommend any recent book you've read or podcast you've listened to or tv show you've watched What's something all of us should be aware of that we might not be? Okay, there's two, um, there's two books. There's the one that I finished yesterday. Oh, good timing. Uh, which is Minor Detail by Adania Shibley. So this is a very short work of fiction written by a brilliant Palestinian author that is about the past. It's about a fictional set of accounts in the desert. Um, in both the 40s and later in the 20th century. It's just okay. like a great work of fiction that helps bring to life the the interaction between Israeli and Palestinian life through characters and, and scene. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then one of my favorite books that I read for If We Burn, one of the mm-hmm. books that I found most impressive, it's a very different one. Uh, 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 Minor Detail is a short novel that is like a page turner. This, this is a, a larger, more serious analytical text, but it's called Bordeaux's Secret Admirer in the Caucasus. How do you pronounce that? Bourdieu. Bourdieu, right? We'll go with that. Yeah, Bourdieu's Secret Admirer in the Caucasus. Mm-hmm. And this is written by somebody that knows very well um, the Caucasus region of the former, former Soviet Union. And he he traces the not only the fall of the Soviet Union to the kind of mass protests and anti-authoritarian, anti-bureaucratic movements of the 1960s, to 1989 he traces the the 1989 back to 1968 in some sense oh. he also looks very carefully at who actually enters the power vacuum and who actually takes over when the when the soviet union falls um in his native region so adania shibli minor detail and then bordeaux's secret admirer in the caucasus by gorgi derlugian we will link to both of those in our show notes, as well as to your book, If We Burn, The Mass Protest Decade and The Missing Revolution. Vincent, thanks for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Thank you.